Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar, How to Be a Peer Reviewer, with guest speakers Jennifer Lovick and Bailey Bowman, and panellists Mary Beth Genta, Stephen Cates and Maria Natasha Raja. My name is Sam Perkins and I'm a Peer Review Manager and member of the Research Integrity Group at Sage Publishing, where I work on optimising our support for authors, editors and reviewers, and specialise in publication ethics and peer review best practices. I'd like to begin by thanking you all thanking you as prospective reviewers for taking the time to attend today. As, at its best, peer review improves the quality of academic publishing, upholds and informs ethical practices, and maintains the integrity of the scholarly record. Receiving high quality impartial review comments is key to this, so much so that not only are reviewers integral to the peer review process itself, but their contributions form part of each scholarly output they support. At SAGE, we highly value the expertise and hard work of our reviewers, and hope that by the end of the webinar, you feel equipped to take your next steps as a peer reviewer. Before we move on to speaker introductions, some housekeeping. First, I want to inform you that this one hour webinar will be recorded and archived for future viewing. We will be sending out a link to the recording to all registrants and the slides will be available on the Sage Review Gateway in the coming days. Secondly, if any of you have any problems with audio or viewing mode during the webinar, please use the Q&A box at the right side of your screen and one of our helpful team members will be back to you ASAP. Thirdly, at the end of the webinar, we will have some time for Q&A from the attendees. So also use the Q&A box to ask any questions to the speakers throughout the webinar. Please also take note of the webinar hashtag, how to peer review, and feel free to ask questions or leave comments via Twitter. Lastly, while we do our best to answer as many questions as possible, it won't be possible to answer them all. We will, however, address any key unanswered questions in a recap on the Sage Perspectives blog in the coming days. The link to this will be provided along with the webinar recording to all registrants. Now let me introduce you to our guest speakers, both from Sage Publishing. First, Jennifer Lovett, whose background is in molecular cell and developmental biology and she's Executive Editor of Cancer Control and Technology in Cancer Research and Treatment at SAGE. Second, Bailey Bowman is the Managing Editor of SAGE Open and has a background in Geographic Information, Science and Technology. And now let me introduce you to our panelists who will be joining us later. First, Maria Natasha Raja, PhD, is a full professor at the Faculty of Medicine, McGill University. This is CIHR, Sex and Gender Chair in Neuroscience, Mental Health and Addiction. Dr. Raja's research focuses on the cognitive neuroscience of memory and age. She serves as Editor-in-Chief for the journal, Aging, the journal Aging Neuropsychology and Cognition, Senior Editor for the Cognition and Computation sections for the journal Brain Research, and recently joined as an Associate Editor for Psychological Science. Second, Mary Beth Genta is an academic toxicologist and has worked in the Department of Environmental Health at the University of Cincinnati, Cincinnati since 1999. Dr. Genta specializes in neurotoxicology and neurodegenerative diseases and has been editor-in-chief of International Journal of Toxicology since 2008. Our third panelist is Steve Cate, who serves as John Cardia Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine. Dr. Cates has authored 146 peer review publications and is the editor in chief of the journal Geriatric Orthopedic Surgery and Rehabilitation. Now that we've concluded the introductions, the session will begin with a presentation from Bailey and Jennifer on how to be a peer reviewer, from building your reviewer profile and working with journal editors to what to consider when conducting the review itself. As a reminder, please post your comments and questions to the Q&A box on the right side of your screen or on Twitter using hashtag how to peer review. Now, without further ado, I'll hand over to Bailey and Jennifer. Thank you, Sam. It's great to be here. Also, thank you to everyone attending today and to all those that helped put this webinar together. I'd like to start with the definition of peer review. Peer review is a process where scientists or peers evaluate the quality of other scientists' work. By doing this, they aim to ensure the work is rigorous, coherent, uses past research, and adds to what we already know. 
The process of peer review is an integral part of publishing one's research and absolutely essential to ensuring the quality of research published and added to the research record. Next slide, please, Sam. Aside from the benefits the peer review process has for each publication, there are also significant benefits for the peer reviewer. The most significant is the service a peer reviewer provides to their respective fields. Each time someone peer reviews, they are directly helping to improve the quality of the article, offering the author new insights into their research methods and results, and giving the opinions of fellow experts in the field that can provide support and further insight. It is also a way to keep up with new directions in the field and could be a gateway to an editor position. Additionally, there are benefits to reviewing in ways in which a reviewer can receive recognition. This includes recognition via Publons and ORCID, where a reviewer can keep a record of publications and show which journals they review for. Also, recognition can be shown with reviewer certificates and displayed as professional development experience on a CV. Stage publishing also offers some additional benefits to reviewers in recognition for their service. These include a 25% discount on Sage books and free access to ebook products and Sage journals for 60 days. More information on these benefits can be found at the Review Rewards link listed on this slide. Next slide, please. I'd like to spend a moment sharing with you what the overall peer review process looks like and highlight the core role peer reviewers have. After a paper is submitted, it is checked for compliance with journal guidelines for things such as correct formatting and for fit with the journal's aims and scope. If it passes these checks, it is sent to peer reviewers. In most cases, peer reviewers are matched to a paper based on keywords provided in the paper to keywords provided by peer reviewers if they've created a reviewer account or to keywords and articles the reviewer has authored. Reviewers are invited to review, and if they accept to review, will access the paper in their reviewer center in our peer review system called SageTrack. Once reviewers have assessed the paper and prepared comments for the editor and authors, they then make a recommendation of revision, reject, or accept to the editor in the system. The editor can then make a final decision based on the recommendations from reviewers. Next slide. All right, when to decline an invite. There are times when it is best to decline an invitation to review. One of them is when you do not have the expertise to review the article. This can happen if we matched you with the wrong article because we did not have the right keywords for you. If you suspect this was the case, please let us know why an article was outside of your expertise when you decline our invitation to review. Also, let us know if you are working towards your degree in a particular field and are not yet ready to review articles in that field. Another time you might decline to review is when you do not have the time and you cannot commit to a specific extension. However, if you have a specific extension you could request and stick to, it's worth letting the editor know before declining. Lastly, you should decline to review if you have a personal conflict of interest with the research or the authors that would prevent you from delivering an impartial review. For example, some financial stake in the research. This ties into the larger issue of reviewer ethics, which we cover on the next slide. Next slide, please, Sam. Reviewer ethics. To start, many journals use double-blind peer review. This means the authors do not know who the reviewers are, and the reviewers do not know who the authors are. This helps us ensure that the authors are not getting an unfair advantage or disadvantage because of who they are, and the reviewers are comfortable providing candid reviews. If you learn of the author's identities when reviewing for a double-blind journal, for example, if the manuscript was not fully anonymized, then you should let the editor know right away. Definitely mention if learning the author's identities raises a particular conflict of interest for you. You should also let the editor know if you have some connection to the study that impacts the study participant's privacy. For example, if you know someone who was involved in the clinical trial under review. Lastly, you will have access to unpublished research, and it is important to keep the content of that research confidential. The only exception is if you are working on a collaborative review with a colleague, which is something you should ask the editor about before you agree to review. Next slide, please, Sam. Research done well. Next, we're going to talk about the evaluation criteria you should keep in mind when reviewing an article. At SAGE, we use the phrase research done well to describe our bar for publication. The specifics will vary between fields, but here is how I explain this to SAGE Open editors. 
we are looking for discrete. Oops, <laughs> too fast, Sam. <laughs> okay, still on this one. Um, so for research done well, we're looking for discrete, coherent contributions to the academic record that have sufficient methodological rigor to serve as sound building blocks for future research. Um, and now we'll get into some of the details of what that might look like. Uh, next slide, please. All right. So when you're evaluating a manuscript, there are some characteristics of the writing and the structure you may notice immediately, such as whether the authors use an academic writing style. For example, whether they wrote in a consistent person and tense that was appropriate for their field, whether they were as specific as possible and avoided generalization, whether they avoided unnecessary colloquialisms, and whether they avoided any unnecessary regional or discipline specific jargon. Uh, though we're not looking for you to copy edit, we also appreciate general comments on the language quality. Some aspects to consider are a preference for active voice over passive voice, concise language where possible, simpler sentence construction, correct article use, and singular plural agreement of verbs and nouns. Again, you don't need to copy edit, but if you encounter enough of these issues to make the article difficult for you to read, please let us know. Next, please let us know if you're having trouble following the article because it lacks cohesiveness. Some specific concerns might include the organization and overall flow of the manuscript, a balanced use of tools like transitions and parallel construction, clearly stated research questions and findings and an absence of extraneous material, and correct use of headers. Lastly, we expect bias-free inclusive language that is appropriate for a global audience. Authors should take care when writing about gender, age, disability, neurodiversity, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, and religion. They should be sensitive to labels and appropriately specific. They should keep in mind that people can have many identities and one shared identity does not necessarily mean shared experiences. It is worth stating here as well that bias-free inclusive research goes beyond word choice and extends to the assumptions made by the researchers and the intention and design of the study, for example, the sampling. If you have concerns with any of this, please let us know in your review. Next slide, please. Some overall evaluation criteria. So first, reporting guidelines. You can ask the editor if you're unsure of whether the journal follows specific reporting guidelines. Not all journals require them. And a good source on reporting guidelines by study type is available on the Equator Network website. Next, a clear contribution to the field. Depending on the journal, it might not be a requirement that all articles make significant or especially novel contributions to their field. However, at minimum, we do expect it to be clear what the contribution of the research is, because it's difficult for future research to build on a study that lacks clear findings and limitations. Next, we expect research to have appropriate ties to the literature. If you notice material that is missing from the literature review and would give necessary context to the study, please let us know. Lastly, a common critique that we appreciate is any issue with figure legends. As a reviewer, you should be able to easily read any figures. If you have trouble, then the author should know to make corrections. Next slide, please, Sam. Okay, um, so ethics. Uh, earlier, we spoke about reviewer ethics. Uh, this slide has to do with the ethical guidelines the author should have followed when performing their study and writing their article. Feel free to ask the author's questions in your review and let the journal editor know if you have any concerns with the research ethics of the article you are reviewing. Specifically, feel free to ask for more details on how informed consent was obtained or who gave ethical approval. If you have concerns about the privacy of the study participants, please let us know. This is especially important for online and open access journals, which can have a wider reach than printed and paywall journals. Lastly, let the editor know if you suspect any data or image manipulation, for example, a p-value that is too perfect or standard error bars that are too consistent. Next slide, please. When it comes to looking at methods and data analysis, there are a number of key items to focus on. The first is any flaws in the study design. Some questions to think about are, are there any clear concerns with the way in which the study was conducted? Is the study design consistent with similar studies in the field? Do the results and conclusions seem appropriate given the kind of study conducted? Is the material and methods section descriptive enough so that the study could be reproduced? Are the statistical techniques relevant to the study? Are they standard for that kind of study? Are the materials and methods used for the study appropriate for the research question being addressed? Next slide, please. A lot of the questions raised in analyzing the materials and methods section flow over into the results, discussion, and conclusion sections. Common questions to think about when reviewing these sections include, 
Are the results presented in a way that best emphasize the findings? Are these sections free of unsupported generalizations or assumptions? Are the conclusions appropriate for the study? Are there appropriate limitations and directions for future research? As you can see, there are a lot of things to think about when reviewing an article. By breaking down a review into sections that match the structure of the paper, a reviewer can thoroughly check all parts of the article and provide thorough feedback for the authors. Next slide, please. So now that you know what to look for when peer reviewing, how do you volunteer to review? Next slide, Sam. There are two major ways you can start the journey of being a volunteer reviewer. The first is to create an account in the journal's peer review site. Make sure you include the email address you check most often, an institutional email address would be preferred. Create or add your ORCID ID. Include your full affiliation. Specify your degrees or degrees and choose the appropriate salutation. Make sure to include strong keywords that best illustrate your research expertise. Examples of good keywords and those to avoid are shown on the right. Good keywords are generally those that are descriptive, but not too descriptive. The second way to become a volunteer reviewer is by connecting with editors. You may consider reaching out to editors directly via email. Many have their email addresses on the journal's website or by creating a Publons account. Next slide, please, Sam. If you would like to learn even more about peer review, SAGE offers a number of resources. SAGE has a comprehensive journal reviewer gateway filled with videos and a detailed PDF guide. The link is shown at the bottom of this slide. You can also visit the Committee of Publication Ethics or COPE website to read their suggested best practices for peer reviewing. This is the COPE ethical guidelines. A great way to learn to review is to also see examples of peer reviews. Some journals, such as Therapeutic Advances in Respiratory Disease, follow the open peer review model, where you can see the comments made by reviewers for a particular article. You can also look at comments made on preprint articles on many preprint servers. To gain even more experience reviewing, you may consider the Publons Academy training course, which provides in-depth training. Next slide, please. We would like to finish this section by thanking you for your service to your field. Reviewers protect the integrity of the academic record. They elevate the quality of the work they review with the feedback they provide, and they challenge their peers to higher standards of research and scholarly communication. Now I'll pass it back to Sam for the Q&A. Thanks very much, Jennifer and Bailey. That was great. And I think it's important for reviewers to have that context and level of detail on the rationale and processes involved. I'd also echo what Jennifer and Bailey said in terms of checking out the resources on the Sage Reviewer Gateway, where there's plenty of useful information for reviewers with varying degrees of experience. Before we proceed to the Q&A section, I'd like to remind you once again to please post your comments and questions to the Q&A box on the right side of your screen or on Twitter using hashtag peer review. Sorry, hashtag healthy peer review. Okay, next I'm going to ask the panelists to begin the Q&A by answering the following question to set the ball rolling. In your experience, could you discuss one or two key elements that you feel constitutes a good review? Natasha, I'll come to you first, followed by Mary Beth and then Steve. So Natasha, over to you. Hi, thanks for inviting me to participate. Um, two of the key things for a good peer review is to be thorough, and I also think it's good to be kind. So being thorough means going over every section of the paper, uh, reading them and giving both positive and negative feedback on that for improving the paper. Um, so you don't miss, say, the results or you don't miss uh, the introduction. You really do comment on everything. And by being kind, I mean, you know, there's someone on the other end receiving those comments. So keep that in mind when you write them. And even if it is double blind, the editors do know, you know, who is uh, being kind and being respectful in their communication. So being thorough and being kinder. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm Mary Beth. Hi, everyone. I'm going to um, echo Natasha's point by being, not only being kind, but being constructive. 
Um, I think that's really important because there is somebody on the other end. And another feature of a good review that um, I find is when the comments are actionable. I mean, you'll have an opinion on whether something is good or bad um, as you review a paper, but instead of vague comments, like the results section is hard to follow, perhaps you could make a constructive um, actionable comment such as, if the data were presented in a table rather than in a paragraph, they would be um, easier to interpret. And then finally, I'm gonna echo something that Bailey mentioned. Uh, we don't expect our peer reviewers to be editors. Um, I find that my reviewers who take it upon themselves to fix English problems, grammar problems, spelling problems, they become very frustrated reviewers and that's not what we want. We want you to enjoy the process. So if there is a problem with the English presentation or a lot of misspellings, just confidentially point that out to us as editors. And then it becomes incumbent upon us when we communicate with the authors to tell them that this needs to be improved. So constructive, actionable, and um, don't, don't, don't do our jobs for us. That's brilliant, thank you. Um, and Steve, same question. In your experience, what are some of the key elements that you feel make a good review? There's a few. Uh, I like um, to see the review in a timely manner. I think we probably all like that. Uh, I also uh, feel that uh, we have a responsibility to try to help the author get published if that's possible. If the manuscript is just not appropriate for the journal or it's just never going to be able to meet the standards, I think it's clear to just say that. And sometimes the paper or manuscript needs a different home than our journal. Uh, but be constructive, be thoughtful, try to help them uh, out with uh, appropriate suggestions as Mary Beth and Natasha have said. I, I completely agree with these suggestions. Um, the other thing is look at look at the uh, paper and make sure that uh, it doesn't drift too far away from the original premise or or thought. So my my way of expressing this is the paper should never get more than one arm's length away from the premise. If it is drifting uh, too far away, and uh, sometimes a few of the paragraphs or uh, some of the uh, discussion needs to be trimmed down to make it a more readable paper. So it should read nice and easy. Uh, again, I agree with what Mary Beth said that we can suggest to the authors uh, about the way they've written it, either grammar, spelling, or uh, use of the language, but uh, try, try to, to do those things. I think that'd be very uh, helpful as a, as a peer reviewer. That, that's what I like to see. That's great. Thanks for all three of you um, for that your responses on that first question. Um, we're getting quite a few questions in um, around who's actually qualified to um, perform a peer review, um, specifically around um, if you have a PhD or sorry, if you're a PhD student or have a master's. Um, so I'm wondering if a couple of you wanted to speak to that. Um, uh, do you use PhD students or students in general for your reviews? And if so, how do you go about ensuring um, the integrity of those comments? I don't mind jumping in there, um, but that usually happens, at least for my journal, in kind of the reverse way. I'll invite a professor to review the paper, and he or she will say, you know, I've got a graduate student whom I'm trying to introduce to the peer review process, and I think this would be a good paper for that person to, you know, to review. And I will look over that review before it's submitted. And in that case, I say, go for it. And, you know, I say, you know, I, I add that person to my reviewer database so they get the credit for doing it. But I'm, you know, receiving the assurance that their professor will have a look at it before it goes in for appropriateness. So I'll, I'll speak up about if by accident, sometimes um, the systems don't necessarily flag if you're a master's student or bachelor's student or a PhD that is the primary author and sometimes you'll end up in um, one of the reviewer, potential reviewers for paper. 
if that does happen and you aren't yet graduated uh, from your degree, I'd recommend letting the editor know. And sometimes the editor will ask, do you have um, a supervisor that could exist on the review uh, with you? And then make a decision based on that. Um, but you should inform the editor if um, by, you know, you were invited and you're not yet um, graduate. Yeah, I haven't had that problem per se, but uh, I, I've had more junior colleagues. I have found that some of the junior colleagues have done a tremendous job with their reviews. They've been very thoughtful and really, uh, done some of their own uh investigation into the references or or the premise of the paper so generally i have found that that people reject the offer to review if they're not qualified uh, and the junior colleagues who really i would say are uh emerging stars in the field have done uh tremendously good reviews and, and i value them quite a bit That's brilliant. Thanks to all three of you again. I'm just to dig a little, little deeper, and as, as Steve was touching on, um, are there any sort of specific traits of uh, perhaps from an early career researcher or a junior colleague um, with their review comments? Do they tend to be more detailed? Are there gaps in their knowledge that you might, um, in general, advise people to strengthen? So I've found some of the junior colleagues uh, have given very thorough reviews. Others have been rather short. Um, the type of review that isn't terribly helpful to me is just accept or reject without comments why. Uh, again, I, I think uh, the authors have worked hard uh, to present their manuscript. Uh, they've done a nice job in general. It may not be appropriate for publication in the journal, but it's helpful to give a uh, give your thoughts as to what the issues were that either make it worthy of acceptance, the revisions required, or uh, reasons it should not find a home in the journal. Yeah, a comment like great paper doesn't really help us much as editors. I personally have found that junior and senior colleagues, if they're interested in the paper, they, they do just as great a job in uh, providing feedback. Sometimes um, the issue is that someone will accept review of a paper because they're excited to be invited to review a paper, but it may not be in their area of expertise. And in that case, it's great if they inform the editor and say, you know, I would like to review this, but I want to let you know that this is a new area for me. And often what the editor will do, at least I have done in the past, will invite a third reviewer then just to kind of complement that to make sure that there's a well-rounded review of the paper. Thank you. Um, and so your next question, panelists. Uh, some journals request that you submit or think about your comments in terms of major and minor concerns. So again, sort of going back to that, accept that overall decision of accept major, minor or reject. Can you talk a bit about definitions and examples of things that are considered major versus minor versus not worth mentioning at all? Well, when I think of major, I think of um, experimental design flaws, like in, inadequate sample size or completely the wrong statistics. So that's what I think of when I think of major or obvious lack of institutional approval of the human subjects or the animal protocol. So those are things that I would put in the major category. And I think I cut you off, Natasha. I'm sorry. I know. I was just saying the minor was what Mary Beth was saying earlier about the copy editing. Like we, you know, you really don't need to comment on those things. You could ignore those kind of issues. Uh, for me, the major comments can also be major structural problems where uh, there's parts that are not appropriate to put in the manuscript that need to be cut out uh, or or it needs a significant rewrite. Uh, maybe it, it needs some additional data. Additional data to me is a major change. Um, it needs another table or a table, it needs to be completely redone. 
the minor changes to me uh, are grammar, spelling, uh, word selection, uh, maybe deletion or uh, addition of a few sentences here and there. For me, the, the major difference between a major edit and a minor edit, for minor one as the editor, I may just go through when the authors have sent it back, make sure that those minor edits were all corrected. I'll read it, make sure that it's it's a good paper at that point and suitable for publication and accept it. With a major review, I usually will send it back to the reviewers for a second look to make sure that it's good to go. For minor minors, I typically don't do that. For a rejection, uh, on my journal, Geriatric Orthopedic Surgery and Rehabilitation, uh, we have reject and resubmit, and we have reject. So the reject and resubmit are, you know, major flaws. Uh, they had completely the wrong statistics. They're missing uh, large bits of data. Uh, it needs a, a complete overhaul uh, for the paper, and it should be resubmitted as a new paper. Uh, rejection could be it's not appropriate for the journal at all. It needs a different home or it's uh, got so many fatal flaws that it's not publishable, at least not in this journal. So uh, that's that's sort of how I, I look through uh, the edits that are suggested, the comments, and I try to sort them in that way. Sometimes in my case, major will be because the discussion was too limited in scope and um, some key findings in the literature that's relevant to um, the paper at that time are not mentioned, and a reviewer will highlight that, which would which might affect the interpretation of the results. And then that is a major revision in my mind because the authors need to go um, either you know refresh their memories of that paper or address the uh, other papers in relation to their current findings, and that might alter their discussion conclusions. Thank you so much. I think. Um, yeah, one thing to note in general and from hearing you talk is that it is just a guide that overall decision around what is most important to editors and helpful to authors are those sort of detailed comments themselves. So yeah, those overall decisions are there as a guide, but sort of yeah, focus on your comments and um that's what gets that's what gets sent to the authors. Um so we've got a good question in here, um, which is if I had to have a resource on my shelf for being a better reviewer, what would that be? I'm not sure I understood the question, Sam. <laughs> I'll repeat it again. Um, if I had to have a resource on my shelf for being a better reviewer, what would it be? I think the assumption is that it would be a book, but maybe we think it should be more like a bookmark or a good website. I would think it would be articles or journals related to your field that you've read and you're familiar with. So you know the content of the field and you're familiar with um, you know, the, the current trends and the current um, methods and such. So I wouldn't say it's a book, but maybe a collection of journals uh, from the journal of interest or on the same topic. Um, and in my field, a lot of like in psychological science, the APA manual helps <laughs> for creating uh, the tables and the figures. Okay, great, thank you. And moving on to the next one here, um, how can a reviewer know if they've provided a good review? Is there a way to get feedback on one's review to ask to improve future reviews? Yeah, I, I think uh, one of the ways that you know that you're doing good reviews is they keep asking you back to review. Uh, uh, I think probably all of us have go-to reviewers for certain topics that when we see something, a uh, specific topic, we're going to say, I know who exactly that one's going to be sent out to. Um, but part of it is uh, is also the timeliness and the thoroughness of your review. So if you do timely and thorough reviews, you'll keep being asked over and over again. Uh, obviously, there's a limit to how much each of us can do and how many journals we can review for. Um, and Sometimes when you publish on a specific topic, then you also become a, 
a preferred reviewer. So if you're an expert on topic X, then uh, everyone else who submits a paper on topic X may suggest you as their preferred reviewer because you're known in the field. So th those are my thoughts, sort of success begets success. And um, doing a, uh, a, a fine job reviewing also helps you be a better writer. Being a better writer helps you be a better reviewer. So I think the two are linked as well. Those are my thoughts. So my journal, International Journal of Toxicology, is a society journal. And so at our annual meeting, virtual this year in a month or so, <laughs> um, I'll have in general young members, young members of the American College of Toxicology, uh, you know, talk to me one on one saying they'd like to do peer review. And so in those instances, I will directly give them feedback, particularly um, if it's a really good review, and if it's not, again, constructively tell them how I might have reviewed it differently or presented my findings differently. And there have been several of those um, young scientists, young toxicologists, whom I've invited to join my editorial board because they have done an outstanding job. So that's um, recognition that I can provide um, is that these young scientists who volunteer um, prove themselves by doing a really nice job and I'm join my editorial board. I've got three or four of them who have come up through the ranks that way. Okay, super, thank you. Um, so your next question, how would you define the criteria to reject a manuscript? Well, that's the editor's job. It's not the reviewer's job. And in fact, as a reviewer, we actually generally encourage you not to put that recommendation in your comments to the author. It's perfectly fine to check that box um, when you return your review. And even if you're really, you strongly feel that way to put a confidential comment to the editor um, in your comments. But you, as reviewers, don't reject papers. Yes, I will echo that. Um, I usually do read the reviews always and look for reject or any sort of recommendation in the actual content, because that shouldn't be in the content or comments to the authors. That's something that you say to the editors privately. Um, and sometimes like with psychological science and in other journals that are, have a broader readership, sometimes rejection occurs not because of the quality of the work, but because of the appeal to the audience. And um, some, a lot of times uh, reviewers will say, this is great work, but it really is more specialized. It should be um, in a more specialized journal than psych science because it might not have the broad appeal. And then sometimes um, when that happens, I will say that in my um, letter to the authors that this is great work. It is not a comment on the quality of the work. It was more the comment on suitability for the audience of the journal. So for me, um, rejection is again, um, it's determined by the editor. Uh, sometimes the reviewers will both recommend rejection, and I typically agree with them. But when I've reviewed the uh, paper, when I review the comments, it's either not suitable for publication. In other words, they chose the wrong home for it. Uh, the other, the other things that might not meet the journal's requirements for a publication, it's you know wrong topic, it's off topic. Uh, my journals for geriatrics, so if they put in one about uh, neonates, that's a uh, wrong journal. So that would that would be an immediate rejection. Uh, I wouldn't even send that out for review. I would just reject it and suggest a different journal. The other the other thing uh, would be if there are so many fatal flaws in the paper uh, or the science behind it is flawed so that I, as the editor, don't believe it's suitable for uh, publication in the peer-reviewed literature. I will do that and I'll make constructive suggestions about how that might be improved. I know that sometimes this is very disappointing and sometimes the authors don't accept it. They disagree with the decision and they're welcome to submit it to another journal. But that is, uh, 
that's how I personally determine it. As, as an author, having been on the end of rejection, it's never a happy experience. Uh, I try to learn from the comments. So again, a, a review that just says reject and doesn't say anything else is not appropriate. Uh, having a, a review that has actual comments that tells the authors why it's not suitable or what they could do better or differently to make it a better publication are very helpful. Just reject is not helpful. Um, so I, I, I think as authors, we've been on the receiving end. I'm also on the giving end. So I try, <laughs> I try again to get back to what both uh, Mary Beth and Natasha have said is be constructive and kind and uh, try to decide uh, what is not suitable and for what reasons. So that's what I try to do as, as the editor. Brilliant, thanks. Um, so your next question, how long would you expect a good quality to a good quality review to take? Um, so to take in minutes. And then the second part of this question is how long should you allow a reviewer? I'll take that. These days, I give reviewers much longer than pre-COVID. Uh, COVID has definitely affected the length of reviews. Um, every journal has default kind of settings that are in the invitation. Um, often it's two weeks for, high, the higher the impact, the shorter the time given, basically, for the review I've noticed in journals that I've edited for. And so if you request an extension, I usually grant it up to a month. I will grant it. and in the hopes that other reviews will come in during that time that I can read and wait um, and let the authors know if it is taking longer than that. Um, but with, with COVID, I think everyone needs to be, be a bit more patient, both the authors, because a lot of people are submitting, and then the reviewers um, who have many review requests coming in. So this is a pet peeve of mine. Uh, the timing of review. So there are certain reviewers who are well-known colleagues, actually a few are on my editorial board, uh, who don't do timely reviews. And again, as an author, that's just not something the author likes. It's not something that I like as an editor. Uh, I think uh, Getting them done in three or four weeks is reasonable in general. How long should it actually take to do one? I think that depends on how long it takes you to sort of digest the paper. Uh, some papers, as a, when I review, I can re read it and have it ready to go in an hour or two hours. Some of them take me longer. I have to read it a couple times, sort of think it through, maybe look at a little ex additional literature on the topic uh, to validate what I'm reading. Uh, or understand it better, and then then uh, do my review. Uh, I have found that the voice recognition software for me, as a as a late middle aged guy, is a gift. I'm able to dictate my reviews into the system quickly. I love that. Um, the reviewer that is taking 90 days to do a review or longer, that's outrageous. And and as an editor, I I. Um, I really dislike that. So I, I have found that to be very frustrating. It's interesting when I tell the reviewer the review is no longer needed, they, they're they sometimes offended. But, but, you know, it's not respectful to the authors if it takes too long to do the review. But the actual time it takes you as a reviewer to review, it's, you know, it's dependent on how quick you form a judgment about it and what you see and are you tired or uh, are you uh, sort of fresh in the morning and sit down on Saturday morning and do your review and say, wow, that was really a good paper or really a bad paper and uh, able to do the review quickly. So I, I think that that's sort of dependent on circumstance, but but timing, really it should be done in three or four weeks in my in my general opinion. Great, and I think I might know Steve's answer to the next one, um, but under what conditions as an editor do you decide not to use a specific reviewer again? Uh, 
Well, I'm happy to jump in here to just start this. Um, I've had people volunteer to review who, um, you know, like completely trashed the authors. And I would never, ever um, invite that person to even, you know, they volunteered. They wanted to review for me, but they trashed the authors or they were unkind and unhelpful. And I would never use that kind of reviewer again. The ones who take ridiculously long and are somewhat militant about the delay, um, I really don't want to use them again. Uh, I agree with what Mary Beth said very much. If, if the uh, reviews are completely inappropriate or they have some bias that they didn't disclose to me, as was mentioned in the presentation, like they're writing a competitive paper that has a different viewpoint and are trashing it. For that reason, I, I th that's that's a non-starter for me. I agree with what both Mary Beth and Steve have said. Um, the rudeness, yeah, I definitely rule root reviewers out in future, and also reviewers that don't really say much. So. You know, accept, reject, or this was a great paper. Um, if you don't give a balanced review of the paper, both positive and negative, I have received a few reviews that were just, you know, <laughs> all flowers and <laughs> no bite. And then I get another review that has all these criticisms about the paper. So when I see a review like that, that also hurts me a bit because there's a, that's a different type of bias um, in the review process. And your next question. Um, should reviewers be checking for plagiarized material and or manipulated slash incorrect data? So apparently we've had a few questions on this one. So yes, if you definitely, I was asked to review a paper once and the person plagiarized the first paragraph of a paper I wrote. So luckily I was the reviewer, so I caught it. <laughs> um, but if you do see something like that, definitely let the editor know, because that's a different type of issue uh, sometimes to, that has to be tackled. Um, but you know, that's not your job to start Googling either and making sure that the person didn't plagiarize. Uh, we usually have, some journals have software that allows them to do a quick plagiarism check on papers and see where there's um, redundancies in statements across many publications. So you know, leave it to the editor to catch, but if something pops out at you, definitely mention it. I agree completely. That's that's great advice. Yeah, I, I agree very much. Um, I know there's software to catch plagiarism. I, I don't expect the reviewers to have that software, but they may recognize it as Natasha said, it might be one of their papers or uh, a paper they're very familiar with that was plagiarized. Um, I think sometimes plagiarism happens uh, unintentionally. Uh, you know, where something is very close, maybe they had been reading it and it just, they spit it out and they didn't actually cut and paste it. But I, I think there probably is some of that as well, uh, where maybe some rephrasing and just pointing out that it's very close to something that was already published. Um, the other thing is if they are using uh, figures or tables from somebody else's paper, that's a different problem a different form of plagiarism and those should be reproduced with someone's permission either the other publisher or the other author should have uh, given permission and be cited by name uh, for reproduction of uh, already used material Okay, and we've had a couple again on um, any tips for reviewers on tools that they could use, for example, track changes and Word to help you as editors uh, when reading their comments. Is there a format that you prefer? Can you say that again? I missed a bit of the words that you were saying. Oh, that sorry. <laughs> find the question so do you have any tips on tools um, that reviewers can use for example using track changes and word uh, what is helpful for you as editors to receive from reviewers uh, 
I personally prefer a list of comments as opposed to a track change manuscript because, you know, then the authors will revise it in the track change and it becomes an uninterpretable mess after a couple rounds of that. And then the other plea I will put out to you as reviewers is if you review a manuscript, provide comments and don't recommend rejection, we as editors really appreciate it if you agree to review the revised manuscript, because otherwise, if it's something that's a little bit outside of our personal areas of expertise, we might have to find another reviewer and that just prolongs the process and makes it kind of messy. So that, that, those, are, those are my thoughts on that point. I don't have a specific format, but I don't like a track change manuscript either. Um, I have done that personally, as Mary Beth had said, uh, as in my role as the editor, after a paper has gone through a couple of sets of revisions and they just don't have the grammar or the uh, phraseology or whatever sort of minor changes, I've made a suggestion to the authors uh, because I just felt they weren't going to be able to uh, get it right. But uh, I don't like it when a reviewer does that. I, I would rather have a, a either a bulleted or a numbered list or uh, some sort of list that are actionable items by the authors to change for their manuscript, uh, whether it's rewriting a sentence that's not clear or a sentence a run-on sentence or a paragraph should just be deleted because it's not appropriate for the paper or there's not enough discussion or they missed five references that should have been included. Uh, that sort of thing. I, I, I think a nice bulleted list is, is appreciated. Um, Sometimes uh, I will see a paper that slips through where it's not formatted correctly for the uh, journal's requirements and, and they do slip through. Either the references are in the wrong format or the, uh, the abstract's too long or something like that. And, and that, that's something that I appreciate if a uh, reviewer points out. I, I also feel that's kind of my job as the editor. I'll right. echo what has been said and say that an organized review is very helpful. So if you organize it by introduction, methods, results, I'm, I like that because I, I know exactly where to go to look at the paper then for the comments. And I think the authors enjoy that too, because then they know where, where exactly what pages they need to fix, what paragraphs. So an organized review is very helpful. And just to Final, just another comment on this point. It also makes the author's job of responding to the reviewer comments a lot easier um, if, if they have like a numbered or a bulleted list to respond to, because then they can just add their comments, agree, disagree, this is the change that I made to the manuscript to the first comment, move on to the next one, on to the next one. So it, it helps our authors, I think, too. So all in agreement, bulleted list then I think one one other thing to know with that is that um, if you're reviewing for a double blind journal those track changes could actually compromise um, the anon anonymity of your review so um, it's worth looking up if you are going to supply comments um, with track changes how to sort of fully anonymize your documents before submitting them and um, we're got five more minutes left so hopefully enough for two more questions um, had a couple again on this. Um, so is it um, the responsibility of the reviewer um, to determine if a paper is a unique contribution or moving the field forward? Or is it just my responsibility to ensure that it is a quality paper? It really depends on the journal, I think. So I think every journal has its own bar for what will get published in that journal. Some journals like you know, science, nature, you have to have um, some exciting groundbreaking findings to publish in. And then other journals, um, it's good quality science that they want. Sometimes a lot of journals now will take replication science as well. So it really depends on the journal that you're um, going for. And I would read the journal landing page and see what they're asking for, for publication and follow those uh, 
those guidelines. Okay, and the next question, can reviewers be wrong in their reviews and can editors come in when this is the case? I've seen that before where um, I think a reviewer missed the boat on something. I think, again, that's the job of the editor. Uh, if you've read the review and you think they really missed the boat or Sometimes you have two polarized reviews. One one is very in favor of the manuscript. The other is very opposed to it. Um, reading both of the view, viewpoints, reading the manuscript yourself as editor, and occasionally getting a third reviewer if you're not sure can be helpful. But I, I have seen very polarized reviews that are a challenge. It's not necessarily a democratic process. Sometimes we have to say that I agree with reviewer one or I agree with reviewer two. Um, and I've actually had, again, as an author, I've had the editor do that with a few of my manuscripts uh, where they had a very polarized review. Uh, sometimes uh, authors will come up with a very uh, counterintuitive approach to a problem which isn't wrong it's just different and it can very much polarize the uh, reviewers so i think it's possible to be wrong sometimes i would view it maybe they're not necessarily open-minded about a different approach that's how i tend to tend to think of it Okay, great. Um, and so let's end with one more for all three of you. Um, could you name me one or two criteria that you use for selecting a reviewer from a pool of volunteers? Expertise. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's usually the leading one. I think expertise. And pr if I have prior experience knowing they do good reviews, that also is a big contributor to my decision. But expertise is number one. You need to, I try and get the person closest to the paper that comes in. Yeah, and for a, a toxicology journal, I mean, toxicology has so many sub-disciplines. So if I find a, a volunteer who fills one of my gaps, that really gets me excited and happy to have that person help me out. And then from there, you know, if, if they, they do well, I'll invite them again. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, I agree with both Natasha and Mary Beth. I, for me, again, timeliness, uh, a knowledgeable review, an organized review, and uh, I, I would describe them as a motivated reviewer. And sometimes reviewers have different motivations, uh, but uh, a motivated reviewer is uh, what I personally uh, seek as an editor. Thanks again. Um, so that's about all the time we have for today. Um, a big thank you to our speakers and panelists for their insightful contributions. In the coming days, please be, do be look on the lookout for a recording of the webinar to be sent via email. This recording will be available on the Sage Reviewer Gateway where you can access many helpful reviewer resources. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all again for your time today and in advance for your future contributions to maintaining the quality and integrity of the scholarly record. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thank you.